Our vision for every child, life in all of its fullness, our prayer for every heart, the will to make it so. So what does that mean, life in all of its fullness? Because if we don't find that, how do we know we're doing it? How do we know when we get there? Well, since Jesus is the one who said it, maybe we should ask him. And so Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give life in all of its fullness. Now let me tell you something, friends. We like to take that word fullness, and we like to spiritualize it, and we like to Americanize it, but we don't know how to actualize it. We don't know what that looks like in reality because if you've been in a lot of the places I have been in and you bring this American definition of fullness of life to those contexts, it ain't happening. So what does Jesus mean when he says, and I believe the promise is real, and I don't think you just have to spiritualize this. I think this is the calling of the church to bring life in its fullness. So this Greek word that we translate full or abundantly is this word parisos. And it means more, now listen, it means more than sufficient or over and above what's required. So Jesus' purpose, his mission statement is to give life that is more than sufficient to give us more than what's required. Now these are very important definitions because they tell us life in its fullness. They clarify the need. There's situations all around the world where people don't have enough. What they have is insufficient. You see that in water, health, food security, education, economic empowerment. So Jesus presents us with this alternative vision of God who wants to bring fullness of life, is constantly bringing into our distressed situations remedies that are over and above what is required. You do realize, don't you, that everybody needs a little more than what's required. You need more than just enough to cover your need. I didn't begin to understand that until I took on something else radical, and that is working with low-wage workers. I went to South Dallas. I began to work with a lot of Walmart workers and people like that, dedicated people, and found out what it's like to live on minimum wage in this country. We develop a Christianity that feels very much at home in the boardroom and with the CEOs, but we forgot we follow the carpenter. This is a working man's religion, too. And the Bible has a lot to say to the average person that's out there in the streets and trying to make it by. And there's this truth, and it's hiding in plain sight, and I never really saw it until I started working with people who barely make enough to cover their need. And it's in all stories. It's in the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, anytime you hear this sermon preached in church, I mean, almost invariably, the preacher says, you know, when that son, when that kid hit rock bottom, he went home. And that's not what the Bible says, and that's not what the Bible teaches. Now, he did hit rock bottom. I'm not, I'm not debating that. But when he hit rock bottom, he said something to himself at that time. Do you remember what it was? Here, I'll refresh your memory. This is Luke uh, 15, 17. How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, or as other translations say it, bread and enough to spare. But I'm dying here with hunger. Now, let me unpack what he's saying, because it's really significant, and it really tells us the boy's motivation for returning home. Now, first, who's a hired man? A hired man is a first century day laborer around the world in every major city. There's places like this in my city. There are those who typically gather at a specific place to be hired for odd jobs, unskilled labor for the day. Here in the U.S., the vast majority of these people work for minimum wage or less. There are no benefits with this type of work and no assurance that you're going to have a job tomorrow. So think about the social structure of the first century. It went something like this. At the very top of that economic pyramid, if you will, you had the landowners. Beneath the landowners, you had the tenant farmers. Beneath them, you had the craftsmen, people with specialized skills like blacksmiths and carpenters and potters. Then came the servants. Now, to be clear, those servant herd had tremendous disadvantages. They still had a level of security because they had food and they were housed. But day laborers ranked beneath the servants. They worked one day at a time. They lived just one injury away from starvation. They were a fraction above destitute. And because they were desperate for work, guess what? They were and still are very easy to exploit. But in this story about the prodigal son, we learn something about the prodigal's father. He's no ordinary man. The prodigal's father is a very good man. And how do we know that? 
By the way he treated his most vulnerable workers, the Bible says he gave them more than enough bread, or as another translation puts it, bread and enough to spare. He doesn't pay them just enough to cover their need for the day. He gives them a little more. You know why you need a little more? Because life happens. You get sick, you can't work one day. You have an injury or your son goes to the hospital. You got a bill, an unexpected expense. If what you're making is barely covering the need, then the first emergency puts you behind and you never recover. This is what I discovered working with low wage workers. That's not my life. I haven't lived like that. But living with them and hearing their horror stories, I thought, my gosh, this is going on. So the prodigal son, he doesn't return home when he feels bad. He returns home when he remembers how good his dad is. And he knows his dad is a very good man by how his dad treats the most vulnerable among them. He gives them bread and enough to spare. Friends, that's the abundant life we're talking about. And it's also a reminder, it's always been the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. That's what led the prodigal back. Everyone needs a little more than their need. Jesus cares about the well-being of his sheep. He wants them all to have equal access to the pasture because that guarantees fullness of life. 